So our, um, our closing speakers um, are Amy from the Center for Longevity at Stanford and facilitated by Sean. Sean is a, another Midwest native from Iowa and has been with the co-founders of several companies. Um, at Honor, he has done everything from being a data scientist to now leading our marketing efforts. So we're really lucky to have him in his, in his most recent role here in the marketing efforts and look forward to the dialogue that uh, he and Amy will be hosting for us. How's, how's everybody doing? Keeping it together? That was incredible, and I don't know how we're going to top that. <laughs> so we're going to try, but we're, we'll do our best. Um, so I'm, I'm Sean Lindsay. I'm an engineer slash statistician slash marketing person. Uh, and since we've been giving a lot of like caregiving origin stories, how did people go from like the tech world into you know the this space. Uh, I actually worked my way through college as a caregiver. So uh, I'm getting a little teared up after hearing her actually, because like one of the things that drew me into this was the idea that we could make a difference for the caregivers themselves. That some of the people that I met while I did that job were some of the, the kindest, best people I'd ever met. And like they didn't get the respect or the pay that they deserved. And so one of my big motivations for joining Honor was to change that. And to hear that from Avaro is like, it's pretty cool. So getting a little choked up here, but I'm gonna keep moving on. Um, so moving on to other things. Uh, I'm joined today by Amy Otopoulos from the Stanford Center on Longevity. She has the spectacular title of Director of the Mind Division which I can only aspire to someday have a title as awesome as that. So uh, Amy, could you give us a little bit of uh, background of, about you and about the center? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's been an amazing day, and it is a hard act to follow. So we'll do our best, because I know we're the ones keeping you from happy ending. Right. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, we'll make it brief. It's uh, worth it. <laughs> I've been involved with aging in some form or another for most of my adult life um, and started off thinking I was going to be a researcher and so I was looking into, I did four years of researching the Alzheimer's brain, neuropsych testing, MRI scanning, and quickly realized that that's not where my heart was. So after graduate school, I uh, came back and directed an adult day health center. So we talked a lot today about home health and um, PACE model, and that's something still very, very near and dear to my heart, and took a break to have some babies, and as soon as I started school, um, ended up working for Stanford, and now in this role at the Stanford Center of Longevity, and it's true, it is the best title in the world. Uh, <laughs> the problem is people think that I instantly can remember things, and when I forget things, then it <laughs> makes it sound really bad. What um, kind of director of mind are you? I know. I start forgetting names, it's bad. Uh, the Center on Longevity has been around for about 10 years. We're kind of new, not as new as Honor, but um, kind of new. And we're a small independent research center at Stanford. And what that means, we're about 12 people. Uh, we're self-funded and we operate by, basically our mission is to redesign long life. We specifically decided to not have a center on aging. We wanted to talk about longevity, um, kind of for the same reasons that Kevin mentioned earlier, where you can't just have a policy on aging. You can't start at 65 and say, this is when you're gonna get healthy and safe for retirement and everything will be fine. It starts as early as birth. And if you've talked to a lot of people, it starts before birth. Uh, so we wanted to redesign long life. We really feel that we've been given this incredible gift of longevity, yet society hasn't optimized the second half of life. So the way we operate typically is we're all from industry. Very few of us are actual academics per se. And we partner with the faculty affiliates at Stanford that we work with and also with um, corporations and organizations who have real boots on the ground who can have impact. So the research we do is not purely academic. If it ends up in an academic journal and that's it, we have failed. It really needs to be something where we've solved a problem using science and technology um, that will help us have longer, better, healthier lives. Great. So one of the things in our discussions that I found really fascinating was everybody knows that lifespans are going up. 
But what's not obvious is how nuanced that is, that lifespan increases aren't the full story. If you'd want to talk a little bit about like the difference between like functional and dependent lifespans, that would, I think, be great for everyone. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the average life expectancy news is new to anyone in this room. Um, I think what was new to me in, in kind of preparing for this is that for current 65-year-olds, we are adding another three months of life every year. So this is an ongoing, um, our, we're extending our average life expectancy every year and it's continuing. We're also extending our maximum life expectancy, which is not something the center does. There's plenty of people in the Valley who are, um, and which is very, very important work. However, we really feel like we're not yet maximizing the life that we've been given. And when you start talking about health and chronological age or functional age and chronological age, our goal really is to also decouple that a little bit. We've talked a lot about the chronic diseases that are going up, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis. Absolutely that is happening. But when you look at our functional age, we're actually gaining not just more years of life, but we're gaining more functional years, and our years spent in disability are actually going down. In about, I think in the last 10 years, we've gained two years of functional life capacity and reduced our dependent life um, expectancy by a half a year. And that's something that's continuing as well. So when I talk about functional, what am I talking about? I'm talking about people who, you know, if I say I know a 75-year-old guy, he's had two heart attacks, he's had two strokes, he has a defibrillator and a pacemaker, you know, picture that guy in your head, and it's not the guy who's skiing black diamonds, and this is my dad, okay? <laughs> so there are diseases that we've been able to manage through um, health care and pharmacy, <laughs> do, do I dare say that, um, and medicine, but he's completely functional. So all of his ADLs he can do, he's a volunteer, he's very active in this community. And I think this idea that the anxiety that's produced sometimes by this age wave or the age tsunami, the gray tsunami, whatever we're talking about, I think there is some concern there obviously, but I think the concern needs to be less on the aging process and more that we have not built a society to support um, longer lives. Yeah, which is a great segue to the, to the next point. Uh, <laughs> so when, when you look at a graph of expected lifespan versus retirement age, it's, it's really fascinating that when retirement age was instituted, that was about what your life expectancy was gonna be. And life expectancy has dramatically shot up Retirement age is still the same. <laughs> so using that as a proxy for culture, you know, the culture has lagged behind these, the, the life expectancy changes. Um, I believe you said there was a, there was a very pithy quote you'd mentioned of, uh, you know, culture was made by the young and for the young. Um, if you'd want to uh, maybe expand on that a little bit, I, I think that was a great insight. Absolutely. I mean, everything, and when I'm talking about culture, I'm not necessarily talking about the foods we eat and the music we listen to, but really how our society has been built, both physically. So, you know, I've talked to people who say, if your knees hurt when you're going up and down stairs, it's not because there's something wrong with your knees, it's because the rise and the run of the stairs were built for 20-year-olds, not 80-year-olds, right? Um, we're also talking about how our culture tells us when we do certain things. And if, if at age 20, you haven't graduated from high school, something's wrong with you. 18 is the year. If by 30 you haven't gotten married, people ask questions. If by 40 you haven't had babies, people ask questions. If you're not working, people ask questions. There's very clear things that we as a society have determined to be when we do things. So education is when we're young, we work and have babies when we're in midlife, and then suddenly at 65, we get to have 20 years of leisure. <laughs> and the idea is, if we've been given these 30 years of extra life, why are we just tacking them on to the end? Why aren't we having them, having longer adolescences, which is what millennials are doing, and they should not be blamed <laughs> for doing that. Um, I think they are some of the culture changers in this, is, is um, choosing work excuse me, work that's meaningful for them, um, not just because it's a paycheck. Living in communities, whether it's intergenerational communities, i.e. still living with mom and dad, um, but also having different ways of interacting with work. And so we talked a little bit about the difference between w -T W2s and 1099s. You know, at some point, I feel like our culture around work needs to change dramatically. Um, and so that's when you look at, you know, John Chauvin, who's one of our faculty affiliates, and says you can't fund a 30-year retirement with a 40-year career. 
financially, that's just not possible for the majority of Americans. Um, and certainly, it's not something that's good for you. We know people who retire are less healthy, <laughs> less cognitively healthy, and they're more likely to get dementia. So there's a wide, and they're less socially engaged. And so there's a wide variety of problems that actually come with retirement. And so one of the things we work on is kind of combating some of these myths around what old age should look like um, and what we think is kind of the ideal. And um, this idea of being on vacation for 30 years in a row is not a healthy one. I know it sounds pretty great, I guess, in theory, but <laughs> I guess the, the stats don't bear that out. No. <laughs> uh, so we'll come back to the, the employment thing in a little bit later, but uh, being that you are the director of the Mind Division, let's. Let's talk a little bit about aging and cognition and some of the changes that happen there. You'd mentioned some very fascinating things about <laughs> emotional stability versus alacrity, I guess, for lack of a better word. Exactly, and this is Laura Carstensen's work. She's the founder of the Stanford Center on Longevity, and her day job is a psychology professor, and she's well known for her theory of socio-emotional selectivity theory, which basically is saying as we age, we, um, gear ourselves and focus more on positive emotions and ignore negative emotions. And the way we often do that is through being more selective about who we spend time with. And so um, there's been a lot of data around as we age that you worry less, you are angry less, you're less stressed, you're more happy, you're more forgiving, you're more emotionally stable, um, you just have a richer emotional life. And this group of people, it's something to look forward to. I have to say I'm looking forward to it. I'm unfortunately in the, in the bottom of the U if you've looked at some of this happiness research. Younger people are here, middle-aged people are down here. And then as soon as the teenagers leave the house, <laughs> all measures of happiness continue to rise. So We need less teenagers is the problem. Ooh, I don't know why I want to say that, but yeah. Okay, fair enough. Fair <laughs> Not enough. in the house, maybe. Um, and so what's so great about aging, and it's not really talked about so much, is that at least for our emotional lives, we are better workers, we're better parents, we're better partners, we're better grandparents, we're better community members, we're better volunteer, volunteers, whatever aspect of life you're talking about, then the experiences that we bring are just better for our society. I was looking for a, a pithy quote or something to, to go with that, something about the tempests of youth, but I didn't find anything. So feel free to imagine a pithy quote right here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, one of the cool things that you guys have done uh, recently is your Sightlines project, which uh, I think if you'd like to describe a little bit about the premise of that. Yeah, this is a new project that we've done at the center. So I didn't really talk about our three divisions. Uh, Laura Carsonson, who I mentioned earlier, is the founder, and she wrote a book called A Long Bright Future. And in it, there's a sentence that says, to the extent that individuals and societies arrive at old age, physically fit, mentally sharp, and financially secure, both we as individuals and our societies will thrive. And that's how the center is organized. So there's a mind division, there's a mobility division, and there's a financial security division. And this Sightlines project was really an effort to take the temperature of the United States, uh, both now in a snapshot and as far back as we could with the data we were looking at using nationally uh, represented data samples and surveys and looking at research-based actionable variables. So what does that mean? It means things that you and I can do to have a longer, healthier, happier life. So for example, within physical health, we're looking at things like exercise and sedentary behavior, like sitting in a conference all day. <laughs> uh, we're looking at avoiding unhealthy behaviors like smoking or too much opioid drug use. Um, and How much is too much? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. Well, yeah, who knows? Um, so those are the healthy living aspects. And what we found right now is that if you take them all kind of an aggregate, we haven't made a whole lot of progress. Yes, we're exercising more, but we're sitting more. Yes, we are um, not smoking as much, but we're not eating our fruits and vegetables. So there's, there's room for growth, is what I'm saying there. The financial picture is nothing that you haven't heard before. We are not doing as well compared to how we were before. So our current 25-year-olds are not in a good financial situation compared to 25-year-olds 20 years ago. 
um, in terms of owner ownership, saving, being a part of a career that has some kind of health insurance program that allows you to save for retirement, some of those things. And then in the mind division, kind of the startling thing, we were really looking at um, healthy relationships, social engagement, as well as kind of community involvement, so purposeful activities. And we found that, uh, just in a nutshell, the current 55 to 64 year olds are much worse off in this area of social engagement. And so that's some work that we need to do um, to kind of dig in to find out why. Um, but also we're partnering with companies as well as uh, governments, county governments, to work with public health systems to figure out ways to both increase some of these um, ac healthy activities and decrease some of the ones that we want to avoid. Yeah, I almost wish we had uh, slides for this because then this graph, they're really like, they're very stark graphs actually. Is like when you look at the changes over the various age groups, like it was, uh, the, the financial one's not surprising, right? right? You know, that as younger people are doing far worse, you know, like far worse indicators, but the, the concentration of the social problems, like the, the loneliness, the isolation, I thought was, uh, it was shocking. I mean, I, I, again, these are things you'd heard, you know, I'd heard, you know, anecdotally, but to see the data laid out and to see, like, this line is very low for people in the 55-year-old bracket, it's, a, it's pretty shocking. Well, particularly, we've already talked a little bit today about the social determinants of health, and I think it's becoming more and more a public health issue, this idea of social isolation and loneliness. It's not just an issue for older people, certainly the most lonely and depressed people, um, research-wise, are uh, college freshmen. Uh, they can be surrounded by people, but they've torn themselves out of what everything they've known, their home, their friends, their family, their dog, whatever it is, um, and they're in a completely new place. So it's definitely something that we are looking at because, I mean, we're in Palo Alto where teenagers are having a particularly hard time. Um, so we, we think of it as this idea of social engagement as being as important, someone talked about it's as dangerous as smoking a pack a day. So um, it, it's something that obviously I think health plans and employers and schools and a lot of other stakeholders could do a lot of work in. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess now it's like, a, this is the more fun part of like talking about the future of all of this stuff. Like what do we do now that we've, we've, we've looked at these predictors, we've seen all of these things happen. What are, uh, what sorts of courses of action do you recommend and like, what could we do here today or tomorrow to make changes for the future? That's a good one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Aside from just getting drinks out in the lobby. Well, I think looking across the whole day that we've had today, I, I want to encourage everyone to, to focus on the positives. And I don't want to put you know, rose-colored glasses on or be very Pollyanna about this, but I do believe that this generation, having a longer-lived society, having more older people in our country than children can be a benefit. And so I think changing our mindset about what that looks like, that most of the older people are not going to have dementia. The dementia rates across the world are falling by 20% per decade. It is an amazing thing that's happening. Uh, we don't really know why. Um, it could be also, <laughs> this information is, the functional capability of every age cohort for the last 100 years has gone up. What that means is, I'm smarter than my parents and my kids are smarter than I am. It's just, <laughs> it's a generational thing that is happening if you're studying intellectual um, functioning. And so between that and the fact that as we age, Yes, there are some functional declines. So processing speed, learning new information is going to be difficult. Uh, if I were to given the choice between riding in a plane with a 14-year-old new pilot or a 60-year-old new pilot, I would choose the 14-year-old new pilot. Um, but not over, oh yeah. <laughs> Video games. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I would not... choose neither, <laughs> I guess. That means you're not but there is this huge increase in knowledge that we're not um, talking about, and it more than overrides the, the issues that we have with processing speed. So I'm not faster at doing something, but I'm smarter about doing it. And so when we talk about uh, changing where and how we live, changing how we work, 
um, changing our views about older workers, which I hate using that phrase because it's like using the word female worker in the 70s. Um, at some point, I think our workforces will be very more inclusive of age as they are now with gender. But when we think about things like that, I think it's really important to acknowledge that the gifts that older people can bring and, um, yeah. Did that answer what you asked? Because now I'm having a mind division moment. Oh. <laughs> It answered many things. <laughs> uh, so one of the things we discussed actually was uh, t intergenerational teams. You know, the, the combination of the speed of younger workers, but again, the emotional stability and wisdom of older workers. Uh, so if you want to talk a little bit about that. There are some really interesting studies out there. McDonald's has done them. Um, BMW has done them where they've compared teams of people who were working. So they have teams of all younger workers on an assembly line for doing cars or all younger workers in a McDonald's franchise. And of course, the younger workers get a lot more cars off the line. And if you compare them to just older workers, they don't get as many cars off the line, but they don't have any mistakes. And the younger worker ones have tons of mistakes. But when you combine them, that's where the magic is. So if you have an integrated intergenerational workforce where you have combining the speed and dexterity and quickness of the younger workers with the wisdom and knowledge and experience of an older worker, you get better results. Your productivity goes up. And the benefit is also that the workers are happier in those. They're, they're more likely to stay with the company in those kinds of teams. So it's a really interesting, again, win, win, win for everybody there um, for the company. And I'm hopeful that employers will start looking at that as well. I guess in the long term, you know, they're probably not going to have a choice. You know, and the, the, given that the age is increasing, you know, the overall age of the population is going to get longer on average. Yeah, so the economists are looking at that dependency ratio, which I hate using. It's a terrible, <laughs> it's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible ratio. So when you hear words like the dependency ratio, your ears should perk up because what it's comparing is people who um, are able to work and what they call able to work are 15 to 64 year olds. I don't know about you, but I have a 14 year old son and I'm not sure I would put him in that I'm, category. I'm, I'm barely able to do that now. <laughs> And everyone under the age of 15 and over the age of 65 is not able to work. And so that's a way that we need to kind of revisit when we're talking about this age tsunami and the fear and concern and anxiety that comes with we don't have enough younger workers to take care of all these sick old people. It's a, it's a false notion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense when you, yeah, there's this the assumption of dependency and yeah, that I guess is incredibly false. So as companies now, uh, how are there any suggestions about how we change that? Like, aside from the, the economic inevitability of it in the long term, uh, is there any way we can jumpstart that process? You know, I think there are most people, so the research shows 72% of current pre-retirees, so these are people within five years of average retirement age, which is 65, they want to work. Most people want to work past 65 perhaps because they need to, and maybe because they want to. Um, what we're showing now by the year 2020, which is not that far away, 35% of men over the age of 65 and 28% of women over the age of 65 will be employed. And I think that's a really important piece to know because they don't necessarily want to work the same job that they've had their whole career. Something happens, as we all know, in midlife where you want to focus your energies on things that are more meaningful and have more generativity and they may want to work part-time, a more flexible job share, mentor. Um, I think the gig economy has been something that's been fascinating to watch for older people. Airbnb tells us that they're shocked by the number of older people who are renting out rooms in their homes for financial reasons, um, but they're also being ranked as one of their highest, um, you know, most sought after uh, hosts because they are available to talk to people and it's done wonders for their social engagement. Yeah, thinking about like all the Airbnbs I've stayed at where it was like an older host, those always were like better experiences. I guess in some ways they, uh, usually there was more interesting stuff in their house for a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm in trouble for that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, so beyond that though, uh, I guess, as a larger statement, what are you most um, 
enthusiastic about for the future for this? Like, what, what brings you hope about all of this ending well for, the, for society and for, for the country? You know, I would say there's two things. I do think we have an incredible opportunity in our aging and long-lived societies, and it just hasn't been realized yet. And I think that's going to take uh, a lot of imagination and a lot of courage to break some of these social norms that we're so used to. And I fully expect, I mean, our country has been one who's worked very hard and always had an idea for every problem that we've had. And so being able to use science and technology to bolster that and to create some of that culture change will be really important. And I, I was thinking of something that um, I believe Seth was talking about earlier. You know, being able to use our technology in a way, uh, my cell phone is smarter than I am, let's be perfectly honest, the intelligence, right, that goes behind it. And, okay, I can't talk about anything without giving a book plug for some reason. So if you haven't read Homo Deus, get it on your summer reading list. I, I found the way that uh, the author Yuval Harari speaks about intelligence and machines um, and how they're taking over, which in some ways I'm perfectly fine having my phone tell me how to get home tomorrow um, because it can do it better than I can. But what humans bring to the answer is their creativity, their imagination, their consciousness. And I think this, in the way he talks about it, it elevates our game. So we're not spending time getting directions, but we're actually thinking big picture and getting a bigger view of where this could go. And I think that's what gives me hope, is that our brains, okay, maybe my brain's not big enough to, to get me home without a map and my phone, but it does help me think about and be creative and dream and have this vision of what a future of long-lived societies could look like. Well, that is a wonderful, wonderful note, actually, in that uh, as somebody who spent a lot of time working on technology and uh, I guess I uh, don't really think that phones are all that much smarter than we are. <laughs> yeah, I've actually worked on a lot of AI stuff and shockingly seem smart, actually incredibly stupid. But uh, yeah, so I think with that, it'd probably be a good time to open up for questions. Um, and then we can, we can go to the after reception. So audience, what do you want to ask Amy? Brian. Um, you, you mentioned social isolation and um, lack of social engagement as being as bad as smoking a pack of cigarettes. Just in, in, from an evidence perspective, where do you where do you get that? And then and then you know, especially given that you know our functional health is increasing in, in, over time. And then, what do you think is a, a good solve for that? So the work of you know comparing social isolation with a pack of cigarettes being um, at the I think the mortality rate for those who are social socially isolated is the same as smoking a pack of cigarettes, and it's twice that of obesity. That comes from Holt Lundsfeld, Lundsted. I'll get you the, um, the research. She is working in this field of social engagement, and it's interesting because there's so many pieces that relate to also your medical conditions. So if you're socially isolated, you're also 64, you have a 64% higher risk of getting dementia. You have, I mean, it's extremely related. I can't say it's causal. That's amazing. I didn't know that. And it's also very much linked to um, social isolation and hearing loss. And so this is something I'm always pushing as well. Most Americans who are over the age of 85 have untreated hearing loss. Most of them have hearing loss. You know, about one in seven will wear the hearing aid. And untreated hearing loss is extremely tied to um, cognitive function loss and, and also dementia. So it's one of those things where I don't understand. I mean, Sean was here talking, talking about Medicare. Medicare doesn't cover the cost of hearing aids. Um, it, it, it's when you do the math, it makes perfect sense that they would. But, and now I forgot your second question. So I guess what's, what's the solve? Is there anything you're seeing that's a solve for that? Or is there you know, ways to risk stratify against that? Absolutely. I think a lot of what happens with older adults right now is when you look at what happens when you age. So you, your kids move out, you retire from a job, perhaps a spouse, particularly for the current 55 to 64 year olds, this is the generation, uh, kind of the mid boomers who are most likely to be divorced. Um, they, and they may have caregiving responsibilities for older parents. They're in a situation where 
they don't have the freedom to make some social choices that they would like to. And so I think that isolation breeds isolation. And so if you don't, if you wake up every morning and don't have someone who needs you or don't have somewhere to go and you don't have a choice in the matter, um, it, it's an extremely dangerous situation long term and it's extremely unhealthy. And coupling uh, loneliness and social isolation with a whole host of other physical illnesses, mental illnesses, cognitive decline, it's become very clear that this is an issue where just taking a pill isn't gonna help. And so what does help is engagement. And so I think employers have a lot of work to do in this, in this field. I think letting people know that, yes, retirement sounds awesome. I mean, all of us right now can just imagine what I would do with a month off work. <laughs> but what happens in month two, three, four, year five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, I mean, it's a long time to not be using your brain, to not be feeling like you're contributing, and that does a bad thing to you. People have to have a sense of purpose. We talk about this for our teenagers, how they need to feel a sense of community, and it's a huge waste of human capital, who, people who are experienced, knowledgeable, who are at the most emotionally stable point in their life, and yet they're put out to pasture, and it's a cardinal sin in my book. The question was if there's any communities that offer intergenerational living. It is happening more and more. So without sounding like a 60s throwback, there's even some here in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, Temesco is one that comes to mind. It's a community in Oakland that you purchase your home, and it can be anything from a studio apartment-sized home to a four-bedroom house. People from the age of 87 to zero live there. And it's an intentional community so that you know you have neighbors and you share meals. And it's, it's a very um, modern way of kind of doing some of these communities. But I do think in terms of going forward, we talked a little bit about, I'm trying to remember who, I think it was Claire who was talking about not wanting to just put Alzheimer's patients in a home by themselves. I agree with her 100% as a, family member caring for someone with dementia ourselves, there is a silver lining to being exposed to different age groups, even if they're not well. And so I see the benefit of caring for my father-in-law in my own children. I'm not saying it wasn't easy. <laughs> I'm not saying there weren't difficult times, but they are learning values and they're learning things that otherwise they would not. So I, there are, there are other communities that are trying to do this, and I think, yeah, the, the idea of having more imagination and more technology behind it, I think, would be wonderful. Has anyone looked at the uh, outcomes for things like Temescal? Like, That's a good question. I'm not aware of that, but I can find out. That I'd would be, be really interesting. Yeah, I'd be very curious. Yeah, yeah, long term. Yeah. Um, any further questions, anyone else? So you talked about uh, measuring kind of chronological and then functional. Um, are you using these sort of index for well-being, which kind of gets at all of those social determinants, right? If somebody is socially isolated or anything else to, as maybe a quality of life measure and the impact of that? We've talked about that. And so if we want to really geek out on methodology at this point, oh, because, buddy. <laughs> because we use different data sets, we aren't able to kind of combine them into an index score as much as we'd like to. So now we're at the point where instead of relying on HRS data or MIDAS data or some of the other data sets that we use, we're gonna do our own survey so that we can meld those and have an index that can have you know some weighting on it um, based on the ones that research has shown to be more important than others. And that's where we're headed, yeah. I'd promised myself I wasn't going to ask any questions about you know, statistical <laughs> methodology for these things. So I'm going to prevent it. No okay. more. Okay. If you guys want to ask. Quick question. Yeah. Um, with the three divisions you talked about, mind, mobility, and financial, what are you finding from a, a meta standpoint of on that data that is going to best facilitate best quality of life in that 30 additional years that we're living typically for our generation? So of course I'm gonna say the mind of it. The question is of the three, you know, between mind mobility and financial security or, you know, social engagement and mobility and financial security, you know, which one would get you the best quality of life? And it, the way I think about it is my grandma's 98 years old. 
of that three-legged stool, she has no money, but she's still living in the home that she raised my father in in South Dakota. Um, so she has enough uh, to get by. Now with some of the new administration's cutbacks and Meals on Wheels and some of those things may not, um, but she has enough to get by. Physically, she's fine. Uh, she also has a horrible diet and, <laughs> and is overweight, but what she has is social engagement. She's in a community where people look out for her, her church, her, even her, you know, her mailman brings her the mail up the stairs during the winter months. So she is, and she quote volunteers for the old people at the nursing home <laughs> <laughs> who are 20 years younger than her for the most part. Oh, wow. So she, I would say in terms of having a quality of life, I think you can do fine with a little bit of money as long as you have enough to feed yourself and get health care. Um, Physically, I mean, she has a walker, but she takes a lot fewer pills than my 75-year-old dad, I'll tell you that right now. And, but having that social engagement, I really think that is the most important piece of it, and having meaningful relationships, having purposeful activities that you look forward to every day. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. So it better be a good one. <laughs> David. No. People want their longevity drinks. Yeah, I think it might be time. <laughs> All right, Red we? wine is very good for you. Yeah. All right, well, thank you guys very much. So thank you so much for coming to our inaugural care symposium. We could not do this without each of you showing up and attending. And I think one of the interesting parts of this was just hearing the chatter and conversation that occurred throughout the day. Um, I had a privilege to talk to some of our camera crew who's here, and thank you guys so much for being here. And one of them said that their mom lives in LA and she's a caregiver, and he now wants her to work for, for Honor. Another has an aging parent and is interested in learning more about what it means to take care of an aging parent. So I think that if we can continue to be infectious with our messages about being inclusive in communities um, as we develop more strategies to take care of our aging population moving forward, I think, I think we'll all be successful. So, Thanks again for coming. Please join us um, on the patio for a closing reception, um, and you'll be able to meet some more of our colleagues from all of our other markets as we kick off um, a quarterly training as well this evening. So thank you again, and uh, drive safe. <laughs>